Story number one deals with Israel and Gaza. October 7th, we saw the attacks come out of Gaza toward Israel. Israel has since responded. We're looking at specifically the impact on global shipping. And this is marine traffic giving you a snapshot of the situation off the area. You'll see ships still coming into Ashdod and here into Haifa. Uh, traffic has been flowing, but there are a series of delays happening, principally down here in Ashdod. Uh, one of the reasons is increased security. Ships have shifted a little bit further off the coast to get away because of its proximity to Gaza. We've also seen 300,000 Israelis called up into military service. A lot of those Israelis worked in supply chain elements, and that is putting a slowdown on the ability to offload and move cargo in. Israel is utterly dependent on imports for a lot of its material, so keeping these two ports open is essential. Uh, zoom out here for just a little bit. Bigger picture, of course, you see the Suez Canal here, Lebanon to the north. In earlier conflicts, principally with Hezbollah in the north, we've seen anti-ship missiles being used from Lebanon to strike Israeli vessels. We know there is uh, Iranian tankers that are going to be coming through the Persian Gulf, heading up to Syria and other areas. And we know that the USS Ford battle group is in and around the area. I'm going to assume they're in this black hole here, southwest of Cyprus. They're going to try to stay out of the main shipping lanes because the carrier for flight operations is going to be zipping around at pretty high speeds. They don't want to be maneuvering around vessels at all. Let's take a look at some of the stories here. This is from Reuters over at G Captain. Israeli, Israeli ports open, but at heightened risk, as we talked about, we're seeing that take place. We haven't seen strikes on the ports yet. We've seen them in and around the area. But the, the most southern town, uh, port of Ashkenton, is, is closed right now. This is an oil offload facility. That's been closed. Ashtad, just north of it, is open. Here's a report from Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7, shipping on alert as Israel's war with Hamas enters the fourth day. Uh, there has been really the only change we've seen in shipping into the area has to do with cruise ships. Cruise ships have announced they are not sailing into the area for obvious reasons. However, commercial vessels are still going in. The question is, do we start seeing delays in loading and offloading? Uh, one of the things that we do know is that Zim, the Israeli-owned container company, has announced that it will fill any shortfall that does appear, and this is one of the reasons why Zim is in creation. Uh, the Israelis know it's a good idea to have a national shipping line so that when war comes, they can rely on it to conduct shipping in and out of the area, very essential during conflicts. Going on here, some other elements. Chevron halts Israel uh, offshore gas production. So uh, this is the Chevron Corporation announced that natural gas coming off the area will be shutting down. Uh, benchmark contracts surge as much as 17% in the most, uh, the most in seven weeks. Chevron was told by Israel to shut down the Tamar offshore natural gas platform because of safety concerns of fighting between Hamas and the Israeli military. Uh, supplies from Leviathan, the nation's other fields, will continue. So this Tamar is in the very southern reaches of Israel, very close to Gaza. And then this story from Bloomberg, what the shock attack on Israel could mean from oil. And they really look at five issues here. Remember, this is the first time Israel has declared war in 50 years. You have to go back to the Yom Kippur War of 1973 to see this happen before. So they're highlighting on five issues here. So number one, sanctions enforcement. The U.S. has sanctioned Iranian oil for a long time now because of Iranian support for terrorist organizations. Iran has been sanctioned. However, as according to this, it's widely believed that the oil market, that the U.S. has turned something of a blind eye to sanctions on Iran's oil flows. This goes hand in hand with the freeing of, of currency to Iran. And now we're seeing U.S. kind of turning a blind eye to sanctions against uh, Iran. There is a chance that the U.S. could take aim at this trade. The Islamic Republic currently sells the bulk of its crude exports to China, sending 1.5 billion barrels a day, the most in a decade in August, according to data intelligence from Kepler. It's hard to be sure how much control the U.S. can really exert. Since Iran's sanctions were reimposed in 2018, 
sales to Chinese comfort customers have increased, uh, increasingly been tr uh, transacted in yuan or via trade barriers. So the U.S. is very difficult for the U.S. to sanction this. We saw an example of this when the U.S. diverted a tanker, the Suez Rajan, from its trade and sent it all the way to Houston, Texas. But that tanker sat off Houston, Texas for several months until they convinced an oil company to offload it because many oil companies didn't want to touch it for fear of retribution from the Iranians. Hormuz Disturbance did a whole video on the U.S. sending a Marine Expeditionary Unit on board an amphibious ready group to the Persian Gulf with the goal and mission of taking units or detachments from that MU, it's a Marine battalion, and putting them on ships to serve as naval armed guards. Will we see a Hormuz disturbance? Remember, if, I, if Israel identifies Iran as a key instigator of this attack, one of their outlets to hit is Iranian tankers because the Iranians have been hitting Israeli ships left and right for years now. Go back to the Turks on, uh, attack on ships like Mercer Street. How wide the readout from the conflict for the oil market rests very much on what Israel does in the coming days. Man, we are seeing a shortfall in production, uh, curtailing of production by Russia and OPEC plus, which means that Iranian oil is filling a big gap out there. If you all of a sudden start hitting tankers or tankers become targeted, that is going to force other tankers' cargoes to increase in value. This is going to create shortfalls, and we can see price spikes around the globe. Strategic releases, if the conflict ultimately spirals into something that affects oil supply or boosts oil prices for a prolonged period, it would be a justification for the U.S. government to further sell barrels from its SBR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Problem is we've depleted the SBR quite a bit. Uh, we've been tapping into that reserve, <clears throat> which is all crude oil, for a long time. So there's a question about how deep you can go to that. And if history is a guide, as they talk about here, Turmoil in this region in recent times hasn't been a catalyst for structural moves higher in, in oil prices. Trades, uh, traders want proof that the disturbances are material for supply. During the height of the tanker war, you still saw tankers moving out of the Persian Gulf, even though Iran and Iraq were throwing missiles at each other and hit over 100 ships you still saw oil moving. So it's gonna take a lot for this to be done. Finally, last story, just to clarify on something, because this, this is reports out here. The White House may send two carriers to show support for Israel. The Ford is scheduled to come back. The Dwight D. Eisenhower battle group is ramped up, ready to go. It'll be sailing probably, if not this week, next week. I just saw that a U.S. Uh, Navy MSC oiler sortied from Norfolk. It's probably going to take position out in the mid-Atlantic to refuel the Eisenhower battle group as it transits. This is a scheduled relief. Now, what they're probably going to do is relieve in place. In other words, they sometimes they'll gap coverage in an area. They would send the Ford back as the Eisenhower comes in because it's not needed. But with Russia, Ukraine, with Israel and Gaza, they won't do that. So for a brief period of time, you will see two carriers in the Mediterranean. Big question is, do they release Ford to come back home? That is the question we're going to have to wait and see that no one has answered yet. So we may see a heightened U.S. military presence in the Mediterranean, especially if they want to leave a carrier on station, because carriers, while they can refuel and replenish, do need downtime. And so you may want two carriers in the Mediterranean to keep a constant aerial surveillance picture up. I think one of the things you'll see the Eisenhower and the Ford battle groups doing is putting up their E2D Hawkeyes, get a big surveillance picture of what's happening, monitor that situation off the Gaza coast, monitor what's going on off of Lebanon, and really track uh, a big picture what is going on in the region.